Uh, welcome, everyone, to our DWCN Theology on the Air broadcast. Uh, tonight we have a very exciting subject. We're going to be uh, discussing the Domitian of our Most Holy Lady, the Theotokos of the Ever-Virgin Mary. And that's the Eastern focus. Also, we're going to talk and contrast that with the Western focus, and that is the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, tonight, uh, we have with us our most august uh, uh, bishops and priests. Um, we have uh, Bishop Anthony from Tallahassee, Florida, Archbishop Mardawit, from Toledo, Ohio, Bishop uh, Lupe from Corona, California, uh, Father Tom from Hampton, Virginia, and our very own Metropolitan uh, from the uh, state of California. The, as, as, as we said, this is a very, very interesting uh, feast day to talk about. In both the Western and Eastern churches, they celebrate this feast on August the 15th. Uh, the Feast of the Dormition for our Most Holy Lady uh, is a old feast. It could be traced back to the 4th and 6th century. Um you know, the scriptures tell us that uh, the Virgin Mary, uh, the Jesus said, Woman, behold your son, and John, behold your mother. It confirms that the Theotokos was in the home of John from that point on. So, that brief summary, i like to uh, turn it over now to Bishop Anthony of Tallahassee. Greetings. Greetings. Greetings, everyone. Um, it's on Theology on the Air tonight. Indeed, uh, as the Archbishop has already said, the Domitian uh, of Mary uh, has been observed since the earliest times of the church. Uh, by we Orthodox Christians, and and we have honored uh, Mary, the Mother of God, with special uh, solemnity. And uh, from the sixth century on, the celebration has been explicitly associated with her death as the culmination of a human life unequally, full of grace, uniquely involved in the mystery of our salvation and the transformation in Christ. But the death of the life-giving mother of the Lord, the interesting thing is it transcends the concept of death so, so that it is not even called death, but domission and, and divine transition is, is another term you may use. And and immigration and immigration toward the Lord. And even if it's called death, uh, it's a life-bringing death since it transports to a celestial and immortal life. Uh, the transition of the mother of God as an indisputable fact preserved by the sacred tradition has been incorporated into the teaching of our church. And every time that we celebrate this great, great, uh, memorable occasion, uh, reminded that this celebration of the mission of the Mother of God, it is as if we're having Easter, because it is the Easter of the summer, and Our Lady, the Mother of God, prepares Easter for us, a glorious crossing from death to life. A second Easter, holy, spotless, life 
living of the human race because today the laws of nature are overcome. God bless you all. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Bishop Anthony, for those uh, the wonderful discussion points. We now will have uh, our very own Archbishop Mark Dowett from Toledo for some more discussion on the Dormition and the Assumption. The greetings and apostolic blessings to all who are listening. Uh, when we speak about the Dormition or the Assumption of the Theotokos, the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, we sometimes get incredulous looks uh, from our Protestant brethren uh, because they, uh, as a group, tend to regard her as just another woman, an empty vessel that God used to bring his son into the world. Yet that perspective leaves us scratching our heads and so many verses in Scripture that refer to the Annunciation and so forth. Uh, we are speaking of the same event in Dormition and Assumption. Uh, the difference, I guess I would say that the, uh, the Assumption is a somewhat more dynamic claim than Dormition uh, because it places her uh, in the heaven in a more direct um, and declamatory way. Uh, so it therefore requires a little more theology and argument. Now, you have to understand we're all walking on, on air off the ground because um, uh, Scripture doesn't come and spell it out in a single one-verse uh, quotation that can be cited as a basis for doctrine. It is a patchwork of various Scriptures, with some logic and some guidance of the Holy Spirit helping us patch it together. And I've come to my understanding kicking and screaming. All right. So uh, we need to regard the concept of the Immaculate Conception and the Dormition or Assumption of Mary as the right hands of her mission on earth, the right and left hands, that is to say. Because the grace announced in Luke's Gospel uh, given to Mary was a singular and unique uh, event, and it was protection from sin, original sin, and personal sin, the temptation of personal sin, lest Jesus Christ be contaminated through her. And if he was contaminated, then he could not be the Lamb of God offered for our salvation. Therefore, tracing it backwards like a good detective, Jesus, we know, was free from sin. Therefore, Mary was free from sin. Therefore, the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is true, and a proper interpretation of the singular grace Mary uh, was given as announced by the archangel. Having recognized that, we also recognize that since she's preserved from sin, she is preserved in in privileged ways from the penalties of original sin that her experience in child, childbirth would be different, slightly different, and her uh, death at the end of her life would be different. So I, I, I'm not sure if I said that the best way it could be said, but I hope I, hope I didn't sound like Porky Pig while I was uh, saying that. Um, so these, these were singular privileges that she had. It helps explain why she was the one who initiated Jesus' work on earth at the wedding feast of Cana. She's the one who started the ball rolling. So um, we also know about the, uh, uh, the traditions of her Dormition from some non-canonical texts, and before people get their shackles up about this, remember that it is common for people to cite Pliny the Elder and, and um, Josephus and other secular writers uh, for uh, proof of Christian doctrines and so on. Uh, 
So the doctrine got defined by Pope Pius XII very recently, November 1st, 1950. But before that, you have St. Epiphanius in 377 A.D., and he states that no one knew if the Blessed Virgin Mary had died or not. So that remained an, an issue. Uh, Revelation 12 refers to her entrance and crowning as the Gebira, the Hebrew word for great woman, or we usually translate it as the queen mother. And it compares her to the Ark of the Covenants. The Book of Mary's Repose survives in a Coptic translation that dates from the 4th century or maybe even the 3rd. The six books of the Dormition narratives is preserved in an aromatic manuscript. Uh, so this doctrine is really ancient. Uh, a Latin text, De Transitu Virginis, from the 5th century, the Liba Requie Mariae, the Transitus Mariae, the Decretum Gelasianum. I, I apologize for my pronunciation as well as the epistle of Dionysus, the Areopagite, 6th century. Okay, so this uh, is an old doctrine. Okay. I, I tell you, you amaze me with such astute knowledge. Uh, and and you can follow up at the end with a, uh, a wrap-up. Thank, thank you, uh, Archbishop. Oh, you're welcome. Yes. Uh, we will now have... Um, Bishop Lupe from Corona, uh, California. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, I would say that the ascension of uh, the Virgin Mary, the Dormition, is the culmination of a life events. That it begins from the beginning of times, with the name being chosen, Saint Maria, Mary. And within uh, her life, the life events that she goes through, it, it starts building up, building up uh, the momentous from the time of the Annunciation, and the visitation to the, um, her cousin, uh, the birth of Jesus, uh, the prophecies that she received, uh, the pain she suffered trying to save her child, free to Egypt, um, watching Jesus Christ growing up, and then see him preaching, teaching, then later on see him suffering, dying, and then see him resurrecting, and then he sees, she sees him going into heaven, so... And then she awaits for her prize, for giving up her whole life to these life events for many unknown people to be saved. So I conclude actually uh, taking a text from what I found a book from Castan Lacoma uh, uh, that he describes the Virgin Mary as following. She's the one who gives birth to the one who created her. And she gives birth to the men who existed before she, but she existed also before him because she existed so the incarnation could be taken place. She's the one who enclosed and and kept on her arms the one who is so immense and infinite. She's the one who kept on her arms the one who has on his hands the whole creation. She's the one who takes on her arms the one who has on his hands the life of everyone. She's the one who saw the need to execute a maternal vigilance character to the one who can see everything. So she took care of the one who takes care of everyone. And she touched every part of Christ, every part of God who is so infinite. 
So seeing the position that this woman has from the time she accepted to be the servant of the Lord, I believe strongly that it brings her to the position to say, you cannot die because she has not committed sin. All you have done is just obeying, silently obeying, loving, serving, or serving with love. And I think it's, 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 she has this beautiful position in, in the heart of God that God takes her with the same purity that she had when she said, yes, I'm the servant of the Lord. Praise to you all, brothers and sisters. Thank you very much, uh, Bishop Lupe, on those very inspiring words about the mother of our Lord and Savior. We now will have Father Tom from Hampton, Virginia. Greetings. I'm going to cut to the chase because of time. In the Anglican church, there tends to be language that is guided uh, from Roman language or Latin. Uh, Yet, this particular feast is, uh, the resources seem to be drawn from the Eastern church. So on one hand, we have the language of the Western church, and yet our resource comes from the Eastern church. And so I got to scratch in my head, and I got like, well, okay, um, as a continuing Catholic or an Anglo-Catholic, I'm asking the question, so where does this come into play within the teachings of our church? In the majority of the cases, the presiding bishop makes the determining call. The term, and I'm not really good with the Latin here, but I'll just read it as best I can, the idea for a, or a thing indifferent. Because of a tremendous amount of influence from both Lutheran and Calvin, Calvinistic Protestant uh, impact on the uh, Church of England, um, you're going to find that some people tend not to hold to the Catholic leanings very closely. They just don't. Um, That's a sad thing for me, but it seems to be a reality. Um, Yet, if as a local priest I appeal to my bishop and say, I would like to hold this feast, the chances are he's going to give full blessings and he might even show up at the service. So it's one of those things within our church. Our calendars that we draw our feast days from on the 15th, it is listed... um, in the particular uh, calendar I have hanging on my wall here, it's Dormition, open parentheses, Assumption, close parentheses, of the Blessed Virgin Mary, um, Day of Obligation. It's listed as a Day of Obligation, but I've rarely seen anybody practice it as a Day of Obligation. The second thing I'd like to bring up, and I think this is, um, to me, important, Many of the Anglo-Catholics utilize the rosary. In the rosary, under the uh, glorious mysteries, you have the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the coronation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Both of these are utilized in our rosary, which is supposed to be a daily guide to prayer for the laity. So the exposure is there. Now, whether priests act upon that or congregants respond to that, that's a horse of a different color. But, uh, you know, there it is. The one thing that I am excited about is the fact that this door is open. Most of the things that people argue against uh, is the fact there's no direct quote of Scripture. Uh, Archbishop Mardal had commented on that earlier that we have to draw a lot of conclusions from just good old-fashioned research and hard work. But there's, because there's no direct command of Jesus in the Gospels concerning his mother in this respect that, okay, she's going to one day find herself 
in this state and I'm going to retrieve her soul and we're going to assume her into heaven. Because he didn't come out and say it quite like that, a lot of people kind of, they don't pay a lot of attention to it. And that's sad. But that's just the reality of what goes on in our church. Uh, But for the um, uh, priest that does his homework and the bishop that recognizes the multiple priests, I think you may see more attention given to this blessed blessed time of the year. Thank you. Thank you, Father Tom, for your uh, wonderful words on the Blessed Virgin Mary. And lastly, we will have our Metropolitan Scalaris uh, give his uh, thoughts on the Dormition and the Assumption. Greetings and may the blessings of God be upon you. Uh, the Dormition of the Most Holy See Otokos is probably one of the most misunderstood feasts in the liturgical church. Uh, I think it's important that we recognize that one of the important aspects of this particular feast is to establish the humanity of the Blessed Virgin, because it tells us in the story of Isaiah of how a human woman gives birth to God and brings salvation to the earth. And the Dormition, which technically means falling asleep, attests to her humanity and the great sacrifice that she made in her her affirmative response to the angel when he announced to her that she would give birth to the Son of God. The Dormition is an, is a uh, tribute to the Holy Theotokos for having said yes. Yes, that she would bring the Son of Man to earth. Yes, that she would bear the seed of God. He, as uh, Bishop uh, Lupe mentioned, was the one who existed before uh, her, but to whom she gave birth. It also establishes for us the fact is that Jesus is truly God in human form. Caused by the death of the Virgin Mary, we established that uh, she was actually human and that she actually gave birth to him who molded the heavens and the earth. In the Third Ecumenical Council, we have attested to this because during this time, there, there was much discussion and dissension over who the Holy Virgin really was and whether or not she could actually be uh, known as the mother of God. And so the Third Ecumenical Council, which was held in Ephesus in 431, bestowed the title upon her of Theotokos, which also means the bearer of God. And so when we talk about this particular feast, is we're talking about the honor of the one who gave birth to God on earth, and the greatest honor was paid to her by her not being corrupted by death, but being bodily assumed up into heaven, where she was placed at the right end of her son and also given the glorious title, Queen of Heaven. And so when we talk about the Dormition, it means that not only did she fall asleep without the corruption of death, but that she leaves the door open for us all to follow suit. And this is also can be connected to the uh, uh, old, what, what, we, what we Christians call the Old Testament, when we talk about several of the uh, early patriarchs who were taken up bodily in heaven. And one of our bishops mentioned earlier, the, we don't know what happened to the disposition of Moses. We know that he died, we don't, but we never heard what happened to his body. There was never a burial ground. And so... There's two important concepts in this feast. The Theotokos, who became the bearer of the mother of God, who was awarded the uh, great 
honor of not having to be corrupted by death and further by being assumed bodily into heaven. This is what this feast tells us about and what it calls all humans to be aware of what their ultimate deposition would be and that they too can be assumed into heaven. That is my contribution. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Metropolitan. As you can see, there is much study from our astute panel on the door mission and the assumption of the uh, blessed ever Virgin Mary. But what I would like the panel uh, to do is to wrap up with final statements of two minutes on what lessons can we learn from this feast, either West or East. And I'll start um, with Bishop Anthony. Thank you. Thank you. As I reflect on uh, this great, great, great woman, uh, the virgin was a unique creation of God who surpassed all people and to include the angels. Yeah. She appears to me as being the only mortal ever to have lived a spotless life and to have become what is beyond the understanding of all reasoning being the mother of God. That's, that's an awesome <laughs> uh, position, and, and she's the only one that's been there because she never sinned. She never uh, gave in uh, to sensuous thoughts, uh, and because of this, it was proper. I would say that she lived on this earth without pain of the flesh or illness, uh, even though she had a life-giving body. Still, as a human being, uh, I see her as, as, as one uh, that was uh, subject to the, the sickness of death, and she did, in fact, die. But her body and soul were not separated from God. And for a short time, the connection binding them together was loosed, as uh, it was the case with Christ as he uh, ascended. Uh, what this is to strive to be uh, more like thee, and, and this is, it seems to have been her life, a, a spotless life, uh, and, and we must strive every day to uh, follow that model. What, what a mighty, mighty uh, woman. God bless all of you. Thank you, uh, Bishop Anthony. And we now will have a two-minute closing from Archbishop Mardell. Uh, I might not even need two minutes. Uh, there are four points worth touching on. The first is the singularity of Mary in salvation history because it was her expression, Nehwe in Aramaic or Fiat in Latin, uh, her let it be done to me, that allowed the reversal of the sins of Adam and Eve. The second point is the, uh, the amusing point of the non-adherence of God to human timelines because he took Mary into heaven in, his, at, in the fullness of time by his judgment. The third is the continuum of divine precepts throughout the ages, uh, through the Ark of the Covenant, to which, uh, which is linked typologically to Mary, the institution of the Gebirah. We must remember that every king of Israel was listed with his mother, and Mary is the mother of the king of kings. Therefore, she is the Gebirah par excellence and the perpetual motherhood of Mary because she continues to be mothers of all of us as expressed in Revelation. And the fourth is the continuation of her work among us through her apparitions in her fight against Satan because remember in Genesis third chapter, the enmity is set between her and Satan. And she is the one leading the battle. She's the one with spiritual combat boots. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, we now have a two-minute closing from Bishop Lupe. Uh, hello, everyone. I I will follow up a little bit in a sentence that I heard from Bishop Anthony. Um, and actually, I see that Jesus Christ shows us that there is a resurrection. And the body and the soul will be together to go to heaven. But then it shows us through the Virgin Mary that there is no need to die. That you can achieve also this stage of sanctity and purity by just being a servant of the Lord with a true heart. And I, I, to me, it's, it's, it's a tremendous inspiration to see that this life that we are living right now definitely is a passing by, and there's another one that is much more beautiful and precious, but there is nothing, there will be nothing that will destroy it. And I'm glad that God fulfilled his promise from Adam and Eve until Jesus Christ and until these days where there is a woman who has the power to free from evil and I do believe that very strongly and I encourage everyone really to have this honorable devotion to the Virgin Mary mm-hmm. as, as she is the mother of of our Savior. Praise okay. to you all, Lord, brothers and sisters. That's thank, fine. Thank you very much for those inspiring words, Bishop Lupe. We now will have a two-minute closing from Father Tom. One of the beauties of this study, or at least from the perspective of a priest, is the fact that we have an added voice, an added person to our um, uh, uh, group when we pray. I've recently had some very slow times in my place of business where people come in and we're not doing a lot of business. We have done most of our daily tasks, and so we have downtime. And I have young people asking questions constantly. Now, I live in the world of where the theological prominence is Calvinism. Anything that smells, looks, or echoes of any form of Catholicism uh, is looked upon with deep frowns and uh, uh, unapproving uh, uh, comments. One of the things that has been attacked is why in the world would you give Mary such high place in your church? And the question I have to all of them is this. Have you ever gone to your pastor and asked that pastor to pray with you about a problem in your life or maybe a close friend? And you would be surprised how many say without reservation, absolutely. I said, well, then the next question I have is, in heaven, are these people that are alive or are they dead and not responsive? And the book of Revelation is presented to us in an incorrect fashion that the saints are worshiping God eternally around the throne. Well, they say, well, of course they're alive. I said, are they deaf? They look at me kind of funny. I said, are they in, unable to speak? Are they, is their intellect robbed of them in heaven? Are they mindless creatures floating around on clouds, playing and strumming harps? You know, and, and I said, this is not the heaven I see. I said, I can call upon Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior for all aspects of my life, but when I want the comfort of someone praying with me, why not ask his mother? Why not ask the apostles? Why not ask the countless saints that are surrounded by the throne, casting all of their worldly nature and worldly goods at the feet of the resurrected Lord and Savior? Why not get them, while they're already there in his presence, praying to pray with me for my life? 
And with that, I'm going to close. Thank you very much, Father Tom. Something really inspirational to think about. And then finally, our very own Metropolitan uh, for a final wrap-up. Well, thank you, Archbishop Cyril. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, do my summaries based upon the great intellect and theological knowledge of Father Tom Hockle of Blessed Memory. What Father Tom teaches us, he says that Mary died as all people because she had a mortal human nature. But we also know that because she was the mother of God, that she was glorified as we all will be by being taken bodily up into heaven, and that she was raised by her son and declared the mother of life. It's important that we understand the salvific role that the Blessed Theotokos played in human salvation and the fact that she attests to the, that we, along with Christ, have overcome and vanquished death. But we, like her, are also human. And therefore, we do not pray to Mary. What we do is we implore Mary to intercede for us. And when we come to realize that the mother of God is available to us, then we understand how much more God becomes available to us because he turns to a human and then he turns to us who are also human. And so as we prepare for the great day when we too will fall asleep, we have to remember that God keeps his promise. And he says, what can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. And with that, I yield my time. Thank you, Metropolitan. This has been a very, very inspirational subject on the Dormition and the Assumption. And, and what it does, it gives us hope that we one day will be resurrected to be with Christ, his mother, and all the saints. I'd like to thank our panelists tonight for such a, a great job and discussion. And I hope the uh, listening audience will have something to take away from what was discussed. And we look for any remarks or comments that will help us improve our Theology on the Air show. And I give my apostolic uh, blessings until next time. Uh, good night.